Well, it's great to be here. Um, some of you will recognize this quilt that was the sign of extraordinary collaboration and which to this day, most of us have never put our fingers on. It's extraordinary. It was meant to be a coming together. And so far, has anyone in this room actually put their fingers on this quilt? Other than Francis. <laughs> Incredible. So the, the, um, the, the theme of openness, and then of course, the, the, the dove of hope and peace. And it speaks very much to this notion of the after times and despair, criticality, resistance, and hope. We'll be talking about our thinking about this book um, as well as some preliminary uh, indications of what we're starting to see coming up in the in the chapters. So there are the slides. I think um, we, we also put them in the chat. There's some beautiful quotes. And that's me. And this backdrop is not actually what's behind me, imagine. But that view on the left is actually the view from my window of the dawn. It's um, you can see the wind, it's very windy in this area, so the palm tree is at an angle, but that is the dawn I see every day. And it's one of the reasons that I wake up so early because I might wake up to go and fetch water or go to the loo and then I see these magnificent dawns and I can't go back to bed. It's just such a space of hope and it's literally half an hour away from that sign, the Cape of Good Hope. And one of the strange things about the pandemic and working from home and so on, is that people made changes. And the change that I made was to move closer to the Cape of Good Hope. Um, and it's really made a, a really big difference to what I'm doing and what I want to pay attention to. The other thing just to add is that the Cape of Good Hope is also known of the Cape of, as, the, as the Cape of Storms. So I think it captures quite nicely the the physical space we're in and the metaphorical space we're in. That's Thanks, good. Laura. Um, the amazing segue there in terms of wind and storms is that there may be some noise uh, in the background for me today because part of our roof was damaged in our latest severe storm here in Ireland. I don't know how you got on there, Ian, uh, also in Galway. Um, so we have people working on our roof at the moment. <laughs> But this beautiful place is called the Flaggy Shore. Uh, some of you may have heard of it. If, you've, um, if you know me well at all, you'll know that this is uh, a very special place for me. It's just a few miles, uh, about eight kilometers from where I'm sitting right now. It's on the coast of County Clare, looking out to Galway Bay. And those of you who might've been at OER 19 in Galway is on the north side of Galway Bay. This is the south side of Galway Bay looking right out to the Atlantic. And Seamus Heaney wrote uh, a beautiful poem about being on the flaggy shore called Postscript. And this is a line from it, um, which I always love and I think of when I'm there. You are neither here nor there, a hurry through which known and strange things pass. Um, it's, I mean, it was particularly resonant, of course, over the past couple of years. So We'd, we don't have time for everyone to say where they are. Laura and I just wanted to kind of share where we're coming from. Although we're talking about this project that we're doing together, you know, we just wanted to get out of our little Zoom boxes and just say that we are in specific places in the world. Um, I'm not sure if we can um, see where you all are, but you, you're welcome to, um, to add to the chat to say where you are, where you're joining us from. Um, and we'd also just like to know uh, how you're all doing today, since we have a nice, small, informal group here. So if you're, if you're happy to add anything to the chat, we'll just keep an eye on that. And please let us know how you're doing. <laughs> That's a good observation, Jim. <laughs> Oklahoma, Kathy, wonderful. Oh, Marion, hello. Uruguay, Macclesfield, wonderful, Detroit. Uh, I can I can relate to that, Ian. 
I'm glad that you could join us today to kind of um, put a little attention to that feeling, feeling overstretched and underrested. All right, I think we'll still keep an eye on the chat. Please feel free to, um, to continue to, to um, put your comments there. London, thank you, Leo. Um, but I'll go on maybe to um, the next slides and talk a little bit about the project and the work that Laura and I are doing, which um, you know, a, a lot of you are aware of and some of you will participate in. Um, first of all, you know, a lot of what we're talking about today about you know, despair, overwork, um, underrested, all these kinds of things. We this this has become kind of a trope during the pandemic. But this beautiful Laura found this beautiful illustration about this notion of the same storm and different boats. So we're going to be speaking about a lot of things today about despair, about um, inequality, and so on. But we know that these are just not flatly applicable to everyone. Um, that we're all just in our unique context and experiencing these things very personally, um, and in our own kind of family community. Um, geographic contexts. And um, the, Francis, I didn't know you were going to be here today, but I'm glad we acknowledged you here. Um, this is a paper that Francis uh, shared with me, some work by the wonderful Rosie Bray Dotti. I wasn't aware of her until Francis shared her work, who um, wrote this paper in during the pandemic in 2020 about this notion that we are not in this together. Um, we are in this together, but we are not one and the same. And she writes that you know, the affective and social climate we are in calls for humility and acting collectively. And I think that's um, something that we can all um, attest to um, as we've experienced over the last couple of years. And we'll talk about that a little bit more today. So um, I'm gonna hand over to you, Laura, for talking about our context. Okay, so the point about this book is to not dwell on these things because the general situation that we all find ourselves in is one where every single person in some way, whichever way it is, whichever boat we're in, is impacted on by the pandemic. And we know that some of us have more better access to healthcare, um, but there's, there's no one whose life hasn't been changed by the pandemic. I mean, I'm sitting right here with my husband who's been sick for two months with COVID, double vexed, you know, known as the COVID czar because he's so careful. Um, but, you know, no, nobody is um, unaffected. No one is protected. Nothing has been able to, nothing's been able to create a bubble. It's been impossible. And when we talk to anyone else, we have to make the assumption that people's lives have been changed, people's lives, people have lost jobs. People might not want to talk about it in professional context, but I think it's the starting point that we all have to make. Austerity, I mean, there's this incredible range of people here today, and I'm sure that we could stop now and everyone could talk about budget cuts, economic losses, this ghastly term, learning gaps, um, underfunding, et cetera, et cetera. It touches everyone in every way and the kind of economic losses. For someone somewhere like South Africa, you've seen this beautiful, beautiful place. The tourism, the loss of tourists over the last two years has been absolutely devastating, for example. Um, we can't mention crises without talking about the climate crisis. It's really strange. The sea that I live on is actually there's two oceans here. And I'm on the warm side, except it's become cold because of melting ice to the south. So that's kind of bizarre. Um, deepening inequalities, one of the things everyone talks about is how COVID and the pandemic has exposed and exacerbated inequalities. The growth of surveillance capitalism, as everyone went online, including those who hadn't been online, there's a lot of rah-rah about it, but of course it's just brought data and datafication into the system overnight. And I must say, I really don't like that that saying that there's nothing as good as a nothing as what was what's the saying and there's nothing as um don't let a good crisis go to waste not my favorite uh, rising and authoritarianism and reasonable expectations of ongoing instability and i was reading yesterday about an american university that had a security threat and they went online overnight and everyone went rah rah isn't that great so we we going to assume that universities are going to close down again whether it's floods or fires or protests or whatever. So there are all those challenges. And sometimes I think 
Next slide, please, Catherine. I think we just feel um, despair. It's really, really hard not to feel overwhelmed when people are on precarious contracts. Um, people are suffering left, right, and center. And in some small ways, some of us have been able to make some changes, like moving to the sea. I think that's the exception rather than the rule. And Catherine and I were, were having this conversation about how does one navigate through this despair? How do you maintain your compassion? How do you, you know this horrible term, compassion fatigue? But how do you maintain your compassion? How do you keep caring? And what do you do? And I think it's this, this that actually has been the impetus behind the book. And now we're done with that part of it. Thanks, Laura. Um, so we're, we're going to talk about higher education for good today, but we wanted to share with you first just the concept um, that we used in our title and I found useful in kind of thinking about how we make that turn from not just acknowledging, but feeling that despair to, you know, finding hope and moving forward and creating um, better alternative futures. And this notion of the aftertimes, I think, is quite potent. And it's um, it's from the scholar Eddie Glaude, which some of you may know, in a recent, I think, remarkable book about the writing of James Baldwin. And um, he talks about the aftertimes as this notion of an interregnum, a, a disruption um, between things, and where you 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 acknowledge what was before and imagine, you know, what is to come. And Eddie Glaude uses this term that was originally used by the poet Walt Whitman in the time following the Civil War, post Reconstruction, which was a time of, uh, you know, as he describes, profound moral reckoning. You know, great the great hopes for Reconstruction were dashed. Um, we, we weren't able to, the United States wasn't able to live up to those hopes. Um, and another after times and moral reckoning, of course, happened um, after the civil rights movement in the 1960s in the US, when many thought um, the country was poised to change, but there was grief and trauma as, as many kind of turned away from the prospect of genuine change. So Glaude is writing particularly in the, in the US context and particularly talking about race. Um, but then he, um, then he casts to look at the writings of James Baldwin. Um, who wrote in that time, in that second after times, um, about despair, but also the notion that that time was a discontinuity and that because it's a discontinuity, it's a chance to grasp a new way of being um, in the world. Um, but that really rests on what we do in the moment. Um, and I suppose that's where the hope is. So Glaude says that here we are again now, and he was writing in 2020, where, where here we are two years later, at this time of crisis, and we're living through another after times and that we can, you know, looking back to what has gone before, learning from history, we can refuse to accommodate and adjust to the status quo. And he writes that he, he talks about this notion of standing askance to the way things are. And he looks to the writing of James Baldwin, especially his later work um, about recognizing the time and the energy and the courage to keep fighting. For, for democracy, for justice. And a lot of these, you know, as I said, this is a very um, specific context that Glaude writes about, but many of these are values, of course, in, in education, higher education, open education. So we borrow the metaphor and these ideas because we think it's an example of work, the kind of work at least that can help to inspire and guide us. So um, in that context, uh, in June, 2021, with these kinds of ideas in mind, Laura and I began, discussing what's become this project, Higher Education for Good, Teaching and Learning Futures. And, you know, as, it's, as we wrote um, in the call for chapters, it's seeking to address uh, in critical and nuanced ways, the complex problems we face, but not just in higher education, but globally, while also fostering action and hope and courage. So we published the call for chapters in December, 2021. Um, by the deadline of February 11th, we received 92 proposals, which was both inspiring and daunting. And we're currently reviewing those and are planning to send final decisions on Friday. So um, I'll hand over to Laura because Laura can share a little bit about some of the preliminary clusters of ideas that are coming up. But just to give a little insight into um, kind of how we're how we're selecting, because there's no, there will be many more proposals that we can't 
put in this project then can be included. So obviously they, they, they want to be proposals that meet the call, this notion of glimmers of alternative futures, that foreground inclusion and equity, social justice, care, sustainability. Um, we're trying to ensure a variety across geographic location, higher education context, authorship, creative approaches. We invited things like poetry and speculative fiction, and uh, many people rose to that challenge, um, which is beautiful. Um, and we want to explore key principles that speak to good. You know, how do we define good? Um, and also focus on teaching and learning. And of course, we're hoping that all of these will be original pieces of writing for the book, which it goes without saying will, will be open access. So um, I might just pass over to you, Laura, while I'm still on that slide, if you wanna add anything else, and then I can go on to the next slide for you. Um, I think just to echo what you were saying about being blown away by the proposals, you know, you have an idea and you don't know if anybody's going to respond, whether it resonates with anyone, whether everyone's just too tired to find the energy. And we certainly had people say, I don't even know if I can find the hope. You know, you're really pushing me. I feel so tired. I feel so desperate. Um, and then a few days later saying, well, you don't have to take this into account, but I, I've come up with this little glimmer. Yeah, and sometimes that feels enough, even if those glimmers don't make it into the book, the fact that this has provoked a glimmer of hope is, is enough. Um, it's a little bit early to be talking about selections because we really are in the process and we are, we are looking at every single one, both Catherine and I have, are, are reading through every single one and then we are also looking at them together. So, of course, what you're doing with a, with a collection like this is you're not selecting for a special issue. You're creating a, a co you're trying to create a coherent whole. So some of the ones that won't go in are not because they're not hopeful or exciting, but because they're not part of that coherent whole. Okay, so here are some of the preliminary clusterings. Do not hold us to this. <laughs> time you see the book you go like this doesn't look like the table of contents um some of them are about countering despair and some of them are about despair so they're quite a number that are despair 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 and then a line at the end about countering despair so those ones are kind of out you know um but the ones that are despair and then here are my thoughts about countering despair are the ones that are really interesting and people are coming at that in very different ways then there's this question of what's good it's not a given you know we obviously set some kind of framework in our call but it's interesting to see how people um, not only interpret that but shape that there's quite a lot about pedagogy in fact one of the things i think i can say which um, certainly surprised me is how much there was on assessment um, it's clearly on people's minds. It's clearly been provoked by the pandemic. We're going to have a really hard time because we've already, you know, should we take one? Should we take two? Should we take two that speak to each other? You know, which two in relation to what? You know, the, people are doing interesting work trying to counter this kind of metrification and this online proctoring space. So there's a lot there. There's a whole cluster of things around infrastructure and we're using that in the broadest sense of the word. So kind of socio-cultural thinking about agency, thinking about non-human agency, and then some very material types of infrastructure questions. Um, models, alternative models. How do we even think about alternative models when we have this neoliberal hegemony? And then some about futures. Which, which is to be expected, I suppose. But in that space, what's interesting is the forms that people are using to talk about futures. Do you wanna to add to that, Catherine? Yeah, no, I think that's great. And I, I suppose the only thing I would add is just to say that, you know, even before we embarked on this really detailed review process, we already knew that, as Laura, you know, said in a way that this is, you know, this is not, you know, the project, you know, we, we see this as a dot in, in a portrait with many other dots of special issues, um, 
you know, digital creations, creations unforeseen, which point to these kinds of notions of hope and resistance and creating better futures. And, you know, our collection will just be one, one small, you know, contribution to that bigger conversation. That was clear from the response that we received. But we have a wonderful collection of people here today, and we wanted to get an idea of what you think. And I think we've been speaking for long enough, so. But I do have one more thing to say that oh, I was yes. thinking. Oh, go ahead. Go right ahead. So one of the things that struck me with, with getting all these proposals of these different examples is I'm starting to think about how change happens. I mean, we all think about that all the time. But, you know, the one thing that people say about change is change happens very, very slowly and then very quickly. And I think we're moving from the very, very slowly to the very quickly spa space. So all of these little examples are starting, get a sort of sense of, they're starting to get into that momentum space. Maybe I'm feeling optimistic, but they add up. And, and so what you're saying about, um, what you're saying about uh, bigger conversations, I feel like we are part of a bigger conversation. Okay, but we are not we are not letting you off the hook. Um, <laughs> and we Leo don't just, have all the answers. Yes, Leo just pointed out that we just need access enabled on that. Oh no, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. Oh, I did. Not where I failed. I we are creating this together, obviously, in the moment. <laughs> oh, that was so frustrating. As you say, how many times have we done this? Okay. Yeah. Oh, and I think it's also UCT. Yeah. Mm. UCT doesn't like one to give access to anybody. So anyone with the link can edit. Great. Done. Okay. Permission updated. Lovely. Okay, so we really don't all have the answer. So please, can you take a moment to tell us what your idea of good is? So Laura, would you just like to give people a few minutes just to write yep. Uh, yep, yep. on board? Yep. Yep. So I'm not going to speak for two minutes, three minutes. Sorry, does it, I'm assuming everyone knows how to use a Jamboard. Just in case you don't. On the left, in the underneath the arrow, there's a sticky note. <clears throat> so here we go, sticky note. This is the space.
Did you want to take like 30 seconds? I guess it's not surprising that open is coming up a lot. <laughs> Um, who said that good is different for different people and rather than a common good? I'm interested in what you meant by that. If you want to speak to it. That was, uh, that was me, Laura. I think that, um, I, I, I hope it doesn't go against the positivity, but I think that um, the assumption that what's good for one is good for all is a really bad starting point. So if we have as a preceding stage that we acknowledge that what's good for one person isn't necessarily good for another, um, that's a starting point to go forward from there. So there's a sense of multiplicity there. Yeah. Which kind yeah. of goes against the standardized notion of well, it's uh -huh. very easily seen in organizations where somebody has decided all the things like the goals and, you know, the performance indicators and all of those things. And I think we've seen some of the damage that falls out of that falls out yeah. of that. So in the UK, there's a strike on in universities and the lack of perception of that is so obvious. Not that I'm working in a university, but you know people deciding think, what's good for others. So respecting differences, somebody's added here. Yeah, yeah. Would anyone else like to comment on anything they've written? Any thoughts they'd like to specifically emphasize? This is Kathy S. Miller. And the reason I want to emphasize mine is just because it grew out of similar to the work that you all have shared. And uh, I'm, I uh, put the sticky note on about the supervisor who celebrates when we let calls for proposals pass. And we actually have a little celebration board where we put that on there and it's like, hey, Victor did not submit to that journal. And we have just a little mini party. It's kind of a tangible way to take the pressure off. And that really, it grew out of that. I think it was OER 20, because it all blends together, the, the care conference. I mean, they're all care conferences when you all lead them, but uh, I just, I want to be sure to highlight that to thank you and make sure that you all know that you're having a, a tremendous impact. I mean, Wonderful. of course, you're not measuring, right? Yeah. No, 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 no. But it's great feedback. And it's also about slow scholarship, which is just wonderful. And um, just the one I want to comment on before moving on is this word trust. It really strikes me that um, it's something people are talking about so much. Well, well, they're talking about lack of trust and the need to rebuild trust. And we all know many, many reasons why trust has been broken down. Um, Catherine, do you want to add anything before we, we move on to the next bit? Um, no, I'm just, uh, you know, obviously I'm, I'm seeing connections between lots of people mentioning, you know, trust and inclusiveness and joy, I'm delighted to see joy there. And just from what Kathy said, I, I think that really relates back to kind of what we were talking about before about this notion of a discontinuity that, you know, the transgressive act, even that small transgressive act of celebrating the not submitting um, can have a huge impact. You know, you're just, you're just really shifting the frame for others, um, which can be so helpful. So um, just really appreciate these, thank you. So the other thing we, we would like some help with, because this is a two-way conversation, is on the second frame. And we really would be interested to hear, and you can write this or you can say it, but it'd be nice if you write it first. What do you think is really important for the messaging of this book, given the kind of context that we're working in, given the kind of issues that you're talking about, and given what people are already writing about, what do you when, when we're making our selection, what do you think is important for the messaging in the book? Hard question, I know. Maybe it's not fair.
I love this. I love this advice. Don't forget to put on your own oxygen mask first. Can't go on. I must go on. There are several of those I want to tick. <laughs> yep. The yay. I agree. Mm -hmm. Thank you. This is incredibly helpful to us. And whoever said clarity about who it's for, you're absolutely right. It's not an it's not a, an existing conversation with an existing in group. It's got to be broader than that. Would anyone like to speak to their, their comments and suggestions? I, I feel like we can open this up for some discussion. Yeah, and can I just say that following the slide, we were just planning for open discussion anyway, so this can be the time that we, that we initiate that. We'd really love for any of you to elaborate on any of these. This is just beautiful, thank you. Well, um, <clears throat> I'll mention uh, my thought because I was struggling with how to put it in, in, concisely into a few words for a sticky. It would be, it seems to me important if we could nudge or, or, or disturb the reader's sense of what the good is or that higher ed provides good. I think at a, a surface level, everybody, including what I would call, you know, the folks that are, uh, you know, in, in my sense, not on the correct side of the divide, you know, that are pushing higher ed into a very, um, you know, commodified uh, capitalist thing and not open and all that stuff. I think everyone just presumes, oh, higher ed good, but they don't really think about it at all and um and as a result their actual sense of the good has become very diminished and you know and if we can just nudge them to start or disturb that thinking enough to go you know there's other ways of thinking about this and open up um not just open up higher ed the ways we think of a open but open up your thinking about higher ed um i guess that's what I was thinking. <laughs> Wonderful. And if we manage to achieve that, we will certainly feel that we've made a contribution. Oh, yeah. Even a little bit, even for one person. And, and maybe related to that, and I know this, I struggled with this part uh, in writing, you know, my proposal. Um, and <laughs> I think there was a bit of a breakthrough towards the end of because I was stuck for a while and I realized I was kind of writing a proposal for a chapter. Um, I was writing for an argument with, you know, who I disagreed with. And finally it dawned on me, wait a minute, what if I actually write a chapter trying to describe more what I could envision could be and target it at people who, you know, I'm not having an argument with. It's just people that might be interested in learn, expanding their thinking. So I think if we can do that, you know, rather than try to convince, I know a lot of academics, you know, we try to convince the ones diametrically opposed to us rather than uh, speak to the ones in the middle. <laughs> or the ones that haven't thought it through yet? So I find some of the, the glibness around good that the 
there's a kind of discourse about the, the glow of good in technology that I, I really want to disturb too. So it's not yes. a dyst it's not a dystopian take. It's not a kind of a this is all a terrible idea and stop the world I want to get off and so on. But it's actually that's two dimensional. Let's actually give it some substance. This technology is not going to save us. Other thoughts? I'll just add a comment while um, people are thinking, perhaps. And, uh, you know, despite the fact that these are stickies, there's so much depth to a lot of these, <laughs> not least in the one that just says simply pause. <laughs> I like that one, whoever wrote that. Um, but this green one right in the middle about despite our exhaustion, the labor of resisting unraveling um, must continue. And, you know, for me, that's a real kernel of, I think, of my thinking, and it's why I, I try and reach out, you know, beyond, you know, the lane of open education or even the lane of higher education, looking at historical examples, looking at literature, looking at poetry and, and so on, because, you know, there are other times in history when, you know, we all, have, we lived through many of them, uh, the, the people in this room right now, um, that there are lessons to be learned, you know, that we can, that we can adapt. Um, so that's why, you know, it, the call was quite open and that, that call for people to write more creatively was was taken up by a number of people. And hopefully that might be a way of, of inviting people to pause and look askance. Um, but I really, I, I, this is so important and I'm gonna think about these things quite a bit. This is, this is really beautiful. Thank you. Good as Nessie. <laughs> if anybody wants us to jump in, grab the mic, please do. And you don't have to put up your hand, just speak. Mm. Um, hi, Catherine and Laura. Um, I just wanted to say it's just quite interesting at the moment what's happening. I'm not sure if you're aware that there's a big UNESCO conference in May around the future of higher education. Are you both aware of that? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, so I know that there are a lot of, sort of collective activities at the moment around putting thoughts together um, for that. I don't know how the conference works. I've no idea. I've just, I've just heard about it in UNESCO circles. Um, and locally, UNISA, uh, the University of South Africa, is hosting um, a virtual conference on Thursday and Friday afternoon, um, which, Laura, I can send you the link if you don't already know about it. Do you already know about it? Um, yeah, yeah, I do. I do. And, and there's some really interesting looking um, yes, very, features very, very speakers. Yeah. So it's Glenda, the end of time. It, it really is. It really is. And there's, that's what I think Catherine was referring to at the beginning of this being a, you know, one of many of these kinds of initiatives. I mean, the interesting thing, you mentioned that UNESCO um, conference. I was asked to write a paper by someone who's um, putting a whole lot of work together for sort of concept papers and background papers. And I was asked to write one of those papers that I interpreted it to be the good that technology can do. You know, it was very much framed in this is a great moment and look at all the things technology is gonna do. And I landed up writing something quite bleak <laughs> because it was partly an aversion to this rah rah attitude to technology that technology will save us. You know, um, I think it just lands up being quite problematic. And, and in a way, this book is in conversation with that. Um, because, yeah. May but I please, say something here? Yes, please do. I think that 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 is so 
is so poignant because I think that it's again that technology is going to do the work and it's technology that's going to save us and it's technology that's going to, you know, all of that. And it just really erases our labor, the planning, the thinking, the care, um, uh, the considerations if you are, um, you know, designing anything with so I'm just giving a workshop tomorrow about working with virtual reality and disability and how awful virtual reality works with disability. It's just very, very, so what I want to say here is that I think that this putting the labor in the technology and the change and the power and the agency is something we have to fight against because it's a lot of work that goes behind any initiative that puts the technology to work in any, you know, learning design or learning intervention. So I guess, yeah, it's very, very pertinent what you're saying here, and you know, really important that we resist and that we rebel against that. This is what I landed up writing in the paper, which is not what they wanted me to write. It was really about resistance and refusal and um, research, actually understanding whether these promises are actually um, realized and, and what's unexpected, because in fact, there are some unexpected outcomes from these interventions. But thanks, Caroline. I mean, your example is one I hadn't encountered, but it's, it makes such sense. Catherine? Um, just based on what's um, happening in the chat now, I just also, you know, again, this notion of that we're all we're all pulling uh, in similar directions. So I just want to shine the light on, and I mean, I'm aware of work that a lot of people are doing, Leo, Glenda, and so on, but I don't know all of it. So if anybody wants to just share some of what they're doing, you know, just to amplify it, invite invite people to attend or participate, just share links in the chat. Um, you know, let's just let's just share this little time that we have together to, to spotlight the work that each of us is doing because um, it, it isn't just about this one project. You know, that was our impetus for today, but we know it's not just about that. Yes, Leo, that's a good point. <laughs> um, where where else will you be sharing your work then if it's not there? Was that a question for me? Just looking at what Leo wrote in the chat about um, open not being a, a, a key strand or didn't seem to be. Yeah, it was a bit. It was a bit strange, but we thought, you know, maybe also it's an opportunity to try and um, and and kind of gain gain some um, attention from people who maybe are not necessarily automatically looking to open kind of open education or practices as being um, a, a kind of a, a a key element of um, higher education futures, um, and. Um, because uh, it seemed like, you know, maybe that's, you know, maybe that's not going to come through very strongly. It's going to be more of a focus on, um, you know, what new technologies are coming and how are they going to disrupt, et cetera. Um, and, um, but, you know, it's just uh, one, one of those, one of those things that we were like, there needs to be a, a, a kind of open education voice in, in, in the mix of this. And, um, but we, we have not managed to be that voice. <laughs> Um, but Glenda, you this might is... have a different perspective on it. Sorry, Kathy, I think you were about to say something too. Oh, no, that's okay. I just, I love what you share about policy. And I think that um, it, I've been in conversations with the, the AACU here. I think that's what they're called about the high impact practices and whether or not open should be considered a high impact practice. And what we're noticing is that there's actually so much alignment between uh, the values and the benefits and the tenets of open with already existing high impact practices. I think you could very much, and going back to that diffusions of, diffusion of innovation stuff, find places where uh, they, they, they do align and submit under one of those other tracks and say, 
you know, oh, you, you we want to achieve this or we want to look at this. Here's a way that it can be done and get your policy presentation in that way. So it's such a it's such a great one. It would be good to have it in that space. So instead of we maybe need to instead of foregrounding open come in the back door of some places and say, oh, look, you want to do that, this already does it or something like that. I, th I think that's a really, a really good point. I think that that is that it, it does really gel with some of the way that I've been thinking about um, about um, the sort of policy, the policy space, because um, it's not necessarily that what what you need is a, you know, a specific policy on open education or or on OER so much as um, policies that recognize and enable, um, you know, all, all kinds of um, good good practices and support people to do them, whether it's something that meets some kind of arbitrary definition of what somebody considers open or not isn't necessarily the most important aspect of it. And these things need to be joined up rather than operating in kind of little um, silos and fiefdoms, I think. I think this really um, also relates to um, Catherine's work with the enabling policies um, guide that she developed for, um, for the National Forum, um, where, um, where Catherine, you really like highlighted how open and digital um, need to be, you know, kind of thought of not as the same thing, but as working so closely together. Um, and, um, and I think that's an important way and is getting people to think differently about what's digital doing for us. It can be a way that we can do things that are open, that are, you know, that are, um, you know, rather than just, a, you know, a way that we collect and process data about everything. I think we have to wind up. Uh, yes, I think we do. And we, um, uh, I mean, I, I, I probably can share the screen just one more time. That makes sense. Um, this, I mean, even this this conversation today with a few of us has given me new ways of thinking about things and renewed my hope. And you know, I just think of all the events like this that you know I don't make time for. And so I just want to say thanks to everyone for you know for spending some of your precious time here together with us today. Um, you know, we, we're not aiming to present a collection of answers, but maybe new ways to think about these, new ways to, you know, as, as you said, look askance, um, think outside the box, and be transgressive, those kinds of things in ways, you know, borrow from history, borrow from, um, from others in ways that can inspire hope in a time that's very difficult for us all. Um, the, the other, um, the final quote from Eddie Glaude is, is this one, um, which I find inspiring, just, you know, we're in the eye of a storm and, you know, we need to find the courage to make bold choices necessary for these after times. And that's precisely what we've been talking about today. So um, with that, thanks. Uh, here's our contact details. Obviously, I hope the conversation will continue. Thank you. Well, I, I think I, I know of almost everyone in this room, I think, if I don't know you or um, call you a friend. So I just want to wish you all best of luck in all the work that you're doing. Um, as challenging as it is. So thank you. Thank you think you might, uh, those who can, could you put your camera on? And uh, so we can see you to say goodbye. <laughs> really nice. Fabulous. Thanks so much. It's been an absolute pleasure.